why is color such an important aspect of design? Well, I think first and foremost, it is communicating before anyone is ever speaking in the space. Mm. It is this um, backdrop to support all types of functions and human needs. And most important, I think color is a conduit for human connection. Mm. And I think that's the thing that I love the very most. It's, it's the humanity of color that really moves me and the way it can bring us together. You're listening to episode 53 of the Happy Space podcast. Today, I'm exploring the power of color with renowned color expert and creator of Love Good Color, Laura Guido Clark. Hi, I'm Claire Kumar, your proudly neuroatypical host, exploring the intersection of productivity and inclusivity. I believe that everyone ought to be able to make their richest contribution, but too often people are excluded from spaces, cultures, and experiences. We can do better. I hope that you find inspiration and encouragement in these conversations, for everyone deserves a happy space. As you might imagine, I've loved bright colors my entire life. My favorite dress when I was six years old was a madras plaid cotton with yellow base and beautiful stripes in green and orange throughout. And I, I, I know you're probably thinking that doesn't sound great, but it really did look good. I remember a magenta graduation dress for grade eight and in high school having trouble choosing between the bright turquoise or the bright hot pink spring jackets and coming home with both of them. It took me until I was 40, though, to start recognizing the power that color had on those around me. I started to be at networking events and doing media work and really stepped into understanding the power of color and jewel tones, saturated color for me in particular, and the impact that it had on other people. You can imagine how excited I was when I had the opportunity to speak with my guest today. She's a color expert. Her name is Laura Guido Clark. She's creator of the Love Good Color methodology, which integrates science and the senses. So you know, I love that thinking. She truly understands color and the effect that it has on human beings. Her methodology enables designers to factor in emotive response when using color. And this, of course, connects to performance. Laura has worked with companies like Adobe, Toyota, HP, Samsung, and of course, Herman Miller. But I sense that her greatest rewards come from her work with her own nonprofit organization, Project Color Core. It is dedicated to painting urban neighborhoods with color and pattern that impart positive messages of optimism and hope. Laura tells us that color wants to be of service, and she explains how to make that happen. She shares insights about why colors become our favorites, how to get two people who think about color differently to think cooperatively. You may wonder why I was asking. And what we need more of in offices to make us feel like we belong. I hope that after listening to this episode, you'll think a bit differently about color and just how very powerful it is. Laura Guido Clark, I am so thrilled that you're joining me here on the Happy Space podcast. Oh, well, it is such a pleasure to be here, and I love what you're doing and loved meeting you initially, so um, nothing but gratitude from me, Claire. <laughs> Thank you. Well, let's, let's let our listeners know why I was so excited to stumble upon your work. It was a post from Ryan Anderson celebrating what you do. And Ryan Anderson, I interviewed on another, an earlier episode in the Happy Space podcast. He's a designer, um, a researcher at Miller Knoll, and you worked together uh, for 10 years um, beforehand, yeah. he told me. So I'll, uh, Ryan, if you're listening, thank you so much for this introduction. I have um, fallen in love with Laura and I have lots of questions for you. And I'm I'm excited for our listeners to, to really dive into their thinking about their own relationship to color. 
And mm-hmm. so, you know, I, I realize I have very visceral reactions to colors. I have a very specific color on the wall behind me. It's Benjamin Moore's Peony, which I love. And then I, I, I ended up finding a picture in a magazine and tearing it out and saying, this is the color I want. And And I had already chosen this chip and it was exactly the same color. (laughs) So, you know, when you, when you just love love it, it's Um, a sign. It's a sign. Uh, My first question for you is why is color such an important aspect of design? Well, I think first and foremost, it is communicating before anyone is ever speaking in this space. Mm. It is this, Um, backdrop to support all types of functions and human needs. And most important, I think color is a conduit for human connection. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the thing that I love the very most. It's, It's the humanity of color that really moves me and the way it can bring us together. Tell me more about that. How is it a conduit for this connection? Well, I think that each of us is who we are, and we kind of say these things maybe in what we wear or what we choose. Sometimes it's given to us, like oftentimes in the underserved communities, Mm -hmm. and it doesn't really represent people. But when we give give it the space and we interact with the kids, it then becomes a way of representing and uniting them. It becomes a voice for who they are and who they want to be, which I think is very, very important. And so I feel that color is this way of allowing us to communicate that oftentimes we might not have words for. Mm. Mm -hmm. It's the unspoken first thing. I mean, as, as a productivity coach, I would always say color code your calendar because it's the fastest way to, for example, if you were trying to exercise more, it's the mm-hmm. fastest way to see those exercise appointments in your calendar. The the way- What that, color were they, Claire? Um, in my calendar, everything around health is blue. Okay. It's, yeah. My joy, my social is purple. My business development is yellow. My, my, my um, active business appointments are green. I, I, you know, I just, I chose colors- and it's interesting because I I use my file folders that way. I use my colors and my calendar yeah. that way. And it was the fastest way for me to identify information um, yeah. for reading words. So that's exactly yeah. powerful, simple. It's really amazing in wayfinding. It is really important to be indicative of a need, whether it is for a greater sense of collaboration stimulation, or maybe something more passive and calm. Mm -hmm. So there are different ways that color is speaking to you and supporting you, which is why I'm such a huge advocate of using it in the workplace. Mm. Tell me a little bit more about the impact of color. It's wavelengths, it's light and wavelengths and energy coming back to us. Can you share a little bit more about what you know about the effect of color on our physiology, on our mood? Yeah, yeah. Well, first of all, I mean, I love sharing this story of um, a study that they did where they took students and they um, put them in a room and they um, were specifically trying to um, pick color, I think, to calm the students. And they found that their blood pressure was reduced and overall they felt calmer. But the but the interesting part was that it was blind as well as sighted students. And so it had the same effect mm-hmm. um, because color is a wavelength and it is absorbed by our skin. Therefore, again, it is this very deep sense of us connecting. So I think that that has always really uh, moved me and it makes me feel like uh, color is much more powerful than we even give it credit for. So I think that that is really important. And I think that there are neuroaesthetic studies that, you know, show that, you know, people feel happier in spaces, especially schools, 
Um, we have a tendency to pick very punitive colors. Um, I often show pictures which of these is a school and which is a prison, and people can't tell the difference. Because tell us more about punitive color. I've never heard that described well, that way. I, yes. Well, um, I read once that one of the cruelest forms of punishment is actually called white torture. And it is when we remove all color from everything, from food, from rooms, from spaces. Yeah. And it really causes people to forget who they are and who they're connected to. And so we have a tendency in our world to pick very institutional colors for schools. And these are vibrant places where children come to learn, to grow, teachers come to teach. We're not supporting or saying what this is in the community. And so these colors often feel like hopeless, honestly. I call them visual deserts. And just like they're food deserts, I believe that they're visual deserts. And I deem that a lot of the schools in underserved communities are visual deserts. Yeah. And so while we always speak about, oh, well, we want to infuse this sense of hope and joy in these communities and the kids look around and everything around them does not support that it becomes much more difficult to believe that we have an investment in them and that they are valued mm -hmm. and so i felt that that had to be changed yeah. because kids deserve to see their inner beauty on the outside it is a really strong reminder of who they are and what their potential is and that we believe in them. And I think that these are really important things that we have to do in the world. And as I said, it's a simple medium. It's a can of paint, but it is powerful. Hey, Happy Space listeners. If you're looking to boost your team's performance, look no further. As a productivity expert and inclusivity advocate, I love showing leaders how inclusivity is the key ingredient in team performance. We travel beyond lip service and explore helping everyone truly bring their best selves to work. Ready to see your team soar? Visit clairekumar.com and book a discovery call today. So, yeah, you know, I had a visceral reaction to exactly what you're talking about. Uh, just last month, I had to go for my annual MRI. And yeah. it's number one, it's in the basement of a hospital. And right. the hospital is an older hospital. Now they have these beautiful color coded lines on the floor to help get you where you need to go. Beautiful <laughs> wing finding. I know it's the blue line I have to follow to the blue wing. Excellent. But I, the elevator doors open to take me down. And the ele I actually took a video of it because I actually gasped when I opened the door because it was three white walls. And I just thought, oh, I, I, I didn't want to go in there. When I went in, I saw that they had this mural, at least, on the doors when they closed. I was like, oh, my gosh. Because yeah. there was no sense. You lost a sense of space. Yeah. In there. You didn't, have, you didn't have a sense of distance. This pure whiteness. I thought, this is a torture cell. Yeah. Uh, it was, I've never been in, I clearly have never been in a purely white room before. Yeah. And wow. So when you said punitive and then you talked about um, white. It lacked humanity, about, right? There was oh a lack gosh. of humanity. There was no sense of you connecting in any way, shape or form yeah. to transition through something that is not a very pleasant experience, frankly, to have a mammogram. So I would think you might want to rethink the experience of what that could be. Yeah. Well, mammograms, absolutely unpleasant. This was an MRI, which now that MRI. I probably yes. had, I'm guessing upwards of a dozen. I'm okay oh, yeah. with the MRI the first time though. Yes. That would have been anxiety inducing on top of an unknown experience. If anybody unknown needs experience. to know what it's like to go through an MRI, just let me know and I'll tell you how to make it, um, oh, no. make I've it through been... easier. <laughs> but, <laughs> I've but, been through uh, yeah. that. Yeah, but yeah, again, I think there are these little clues that we need to be a little bit more mindful of, of people's needs and their experiences. And I believe that color, color wants to be of service and that we should think of it that way, that we should think of it as connected 
to an impact and that it wants to serve us. And so when we think of color that way, it takes it out of the realm of what's in, what's ah. popular. It really moves into the realm of what does it do to serve me and my needs and how can it help me be better? And I think that being mindful, well-being, all of these things are things that we're now starting to really acknowledge. And um, I just want to push it to the forefront in these schools where they really, they really get these environments that they do seem very hopeless, honestly. And so, I think it yeah. needs to change. So. so you've mentioned schools and you've mentioned children a few times. You're a designer with a renowned program about color and understanding color for organizations, but let's go right to talking about why you're talking about schools, underprivileged schools, and what you do to help color be of service in this environment. Yeah, well, about 12 years ago, I had this, this aha moment. I was asked to be a blogger for Fast Company, and I was petrified, and I didn't know what I was going to write about. And that night, I, I went to bed, and I had this very profound dream that I was in President Obama's office mm -hmm. and he kept talking about hope and change which was his you know what he talked about all the time but when I looked down it, he was holding a can of peat and I realized at that moment that I needed to take what I know and to be of service to the communities that needed color because I saw what it did for my clients I had been living in that world for many many years but what I realized is that it had the opportunity to create joyful environments that kids could feel connection and, and equity. I think that's very important in this sense of um, joy, which they often lack. So I founded a nonprofit that next day. Actually, I bought wow. um, how to how to um, form a nonprofit for dummies. <laughs> I read the book. It's luckily, not for the faint of heart, I don't think. Yeah. Well, luckily, I am such an optimist that yeah. I just, I just go for it. Like I'm like I really want to do this, and so I am not the kind of person who's like gonna spend a year and say, "Was this gonna?" I'm just like my heart told me needed to happen. I did it. I had um, someone in my office, Krista who was super brilliant and she read the book and got way more out of it than I did. And so she was very, very helpful um, in helping me form the organization. But what we do and what I really dreamed about in this organization, that this was not an organization that does things for communities, we do them with communities. Mm. And so our process is highly interactive. So we began by just asking the kids, how do you want to feel when you come to school? And what are your favorite colors? And tell us about those. And so we learn, we take all these surveys, and then we actually have this structured workshop. And we go in and we teach the kids and the teachers all about color. And we also have them read back a lot of their responses so they understand that they're seen and heard. Mm -hmm. So, uh, for example, they might say, you know, um, orange makes me feel like I ate breakfast in the morning or oh, pink right. has this lost feeling. It's wide and it's beautiful. I mean, like prolific, prolific, incredible things. And then they tell us, I want to feel safe at school. I want to feel happy. I want to feel connected. I want to feel. And we take these words and we make these word clouds mm -hmm. and we show them like how big, the bigger the word, the more the kids said that. Yeah. And that's how we base our color palettes. We go off of their emotional needs. Oh. And so we create color palettes and we create them and base them on their words too. So you could have, you know, happy rainbow and magical energy. They're all very, they feel very different. We want them to have two very disparate feelings so that mm -hmm. um, we can work with designers. We work with designers, artists, and um, we create the palettes with them. And then they create two renderings from each of them have two words. And then we go back and the kids vote. Oh, I love it. Mm -hmm. And they think that, I mean, they're like lobbyists in the making. I mean, if you saw the way they like 
try to like influence one another, like vote for this or vote for that. I mean, it's really quite wonderful. And um, that's how the, the process, the next process that begins is we come and paint and they can come and paint. Um, we work with professional painters. It was really important for me that that their surroundings were impeccable, mm. that they felt a sense of the deep. Yeah, a bad paint job. They have. A no bad, bad paint job, job is not energy. No. <laughs> no, and we have volunteers, but we know how to use them on like yes. talks and then in er certain areas, but we have like fill in the numbers, but we're always guided by professional painters, but we want the community and the kids. We have a lot of volunteers who come out um, and paint, but the kids can see from beginning to end, this was their needs, their desires, their hopes. Everything is reflective of them. And every school has a very different feeling, have different words, different cultures, and they're all reflected in the color palettes and the designs that we that we do for the schools. And uh, we're now on, I think, our 23rd project. And we're in four cities across the country, hopefully expanding next year to two more cities. Yeah. But um, we're growing. And I think people are really starting to see how how important this work is to the kids and to the communities. And so um, I'm always really heartened when we're out there and when we finish a project that, you know, how kind and loving the kids are and they write us these letters. You know? I was going to just ask you, yeah, yeah. What, what do you hear afterwards? You know, oh, the they... during must be magical. Yeah. And then <laughs> afterwards, what, what, do you, what do you hear? We hear things like, um, before I didn't want to go out and play, but now I, I love going out to play. Wow. And one little boy named Ulysses said, I love spreading emotions with color. And um, they just tell us these really wonderful things. They, they say things like, my school is beautiful and I did it, which is like one of the most important things that could ever come out of their mouth. Yeah, just... It makes you really emotional because they own it and they're empowered. And now they have this tool, this color tool that now they could use in their personal lives. It's going to um, drive their place attachment too, isn't it? It's, yes. Right? Their connection to that space because they had Absolutely. an opportunity to influence it. Yeah. Yeah. And and honestly, like it, I mean, and some of you were talking about some of the neurostrives, like it's it's shown like it influences like school pride, it reduces disruptive behavior. Um, it it has huge influences on the kids, their connection to their school and to the surrounding environment. It is really important that it feeds us. I mean, it nourishes us mm -hmm. in very profound ways. And so I'm always advocating that just like books and school lunches, we are really important too because we are nourishing the children in, in a different way. Mm -hmm. And we need to start advocating more for their rights to have beautiful and meaningful environments. Yeah, I love that. Okay, I want to take that thought mm -hmm. and then as I think back on the places that I've been invited to work in as a grown up, okay. they have not been particularly inspiring or <laughs> colorful either. So what happens? What do we do for the grown ups who are starved yeah. for color as well? What happens yeah. in the workplace today when color, you know, I see it being more of a conversation, but still, especially in the home space, I'm seeing, you know, we were wed with white and gray for so long. For yeah. probably a decade, that was the vogue, you know, you're going you're gonna to hire a stager to do your home while you know all the color is disappearing. Yeah. Um, so tell me about workplaces in particular, though, and where are we with color and our bravery to nourish ourselves with color in the workplace? You know, I think, I think that designers are extremely talented and that they want to and do create really beautiful, meaningful spaces. I think that there's something about color that there might be a bit of a reticence about putting a little stake in the ground about color and how much of it is really needed. I think that now we're starting to understand more that it is a human need and that it can support so many of our functions that we 
that are varied as we move through space and time. And one color can't serve that. And so I think that we are really starting to understand that we need to push the medium and feel a sense of empowerment in doing it. And I think what happens too, and I think this is why I, I really wanted to develop a color system was because there's so much, there's pushback sometimes from clients who might not understand and that the more we have a rationale for why we're doing what we're doing, the more a client will understand this is not a whim or uh, um, some trend that might be over by the time it's installed, that this is truly supporting a function, a need, and that it could help their people work better and mm -hmm. feel better. Yeah. And that as a as a company, I think you'd want to invest in that. So I look at it as just as important as the wellness rooms or the cafes or the all of those things. They have to be starting to think about it on even par with those things. Do you have an exercise for executives to get them back in touch with their relationship to color? Um, one exercise that I think is really, really fun is to ask them to pick um, their favorite color mm -hmm. and then ask them to pick a color that they hate mm -hmm. and then ask them to pick a color that makes the two of them work together. And then all Ooh. of a sudden they don't hate that color like they used to because color is contextual and it's yes. in relationship all the time, right? So all of a sudden, you're not isolating this one thing. You are understanding that in relationship, actually, yeah. it could be quite beautiful. So it's a fun exercise. Oh, yeah. But I do want to mention that the reason colors become favorite colors is because they're the sum total of all of our positive memories with these colors. So a color becomes a favorite because it's associated with a bunch of positive things, which is why it is not um, any kind of wonder that blue is a favorite color. Because if you think of sky and water being so dominant and being such a positive experience, then it is no wonder that blue has become a favorite. Mm -hmm. So I think having people maybe voice a little bit about what they like and what they don't like, and also being respectful of that. I never, I never push a client to a color that they really have a visceral color memory of. But with our color system, one of the things that we talk about is that there are colors that have color qualities that are the same. And so perhaps you don't like this color as a ochre, but perhaps this quality of color as a blue could be very appealing to you. And it will do a very similar, it'll do a similar thing. And so that's what we try to do is to try to under, have them understand what they're trying to achieve. Tell me a little bit more about what you mean by quality of color. If I hear ochre and blue, I think wildly different. So like, <laughs> what do you mean by, you know, the, the so, quality? So that let's just them? imagine. Um, so we, we talk about temperaments in our color system. They're like emotive traits. Mm. So oftentimes um, the saturation and brightness of a color will have a greater effect than the hue. So we always talk about everything in hue, which is important. And we talk about drawdowns light to dark. We all understand light to dark. Mm -hmm. But when you understand a temperament, it's the quality of that color. It's saying like, maybe that all these like paler, fresher colors have a similar feeling. And therefore, if you might not like it in pink, you may like it in green. Mm -hmm. So when you understand the emotive response that you want, when you understand what you're trying to connect it to, then you can actually present different temperaments that could be utilized. Yeah. And that way it doesn't become a conversation that's often, I don't like that color. Yeah. I don't know. I don't like that. I don't like that color. And so designers have to go back to the table and reimagine what 
another thing. But if you're understanding the quality of color, then you would just be selecting from different qualities and saying, oh, well, how about this? Mm -hmm. Without having to reinvent the entire, mm. the entire palette. And I think that those are things that are important. And then you come out with the rationale, like we pick this because this is who you are, you know, as a brand, a person, whatever you're doing, this is how you said you want people to feel in these spaces. Mm -hmm. It's a very different exercise. Mm -hmm. And when you're programming spaces, it is really important as you're transitioning from space to space to think about what color is doing and um, how it could be the most powerful. Mm. Uh, where I want to go here is, so we're thinking about providing options in different colors in spaces as a leader might be thinking, yeah, we need to brighten this place up. We need to add some color. Is there anything to keep in mind about, you know, colors that it, it, I'm hearing that it's colors working together and choosing a palette that, that works together. Yeah. That's going to be helpful. What happens when, you know, I have, I have you know, a dislike of some colors that I've seen used um, as strong co brand colors. There's yes. one pharmacy in Canada that has a green that's quite evocative to me of hospital green from the fifties. And so I have don't love that, that green. You, yeah. I'm thinking paired with a mauve, it might be beautiful, but, you know, <laughs> but it's a memory. It's, yeah. a memory. it's yeah. like, it's connected to something. Um, and you have every right to feel those things you know, um, but there are other qualities of green that could say the same thing that you might love. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. I, mean, I have, I love lots of greens. I love that. I, I tend to be drawn to really saturated energies of color, deep jewel tones, and they yeah. actually look better on me. Is there any relationship to colors that actually suit a person there and their affinity for them? Or is that completely, you know, just, you know, I just, I don't know the answer to that. I do know that there are people who do do color, mm -hmm. you know, and, and fashion. Yeah. Um, I've never really delved into like what we're attracted to. Um, I do know that there are certain things that we have affinities for. And I think it's because we've had good, you know, good things good feedback. Happen. Yeah. 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 You yeah. know, so we think, oh, you know, this is great. But yeah. I think that most important is where you put that color and what the dosage is. Mm. And dosage is really critical. Mm -hmm. And I always liken it to, if you think about the Fiat 500 and the Mini, yes. and you think about um, an Audi wagon, you yes. might not use the same colors because the scale is quite different. Yeah. So in a Mini and a Fiat, you could get away with sweeter little fun colors because yes. the dosage is smaller but they might not play out in higher dosages. You know, this is might... what I feel about shoes. The size six <laughs> shoe is really cute. And then I have to buy it in a size nine and a half. <laughs> and it's no longer cute. <laughs> it's exactly it's what the dosage thing, Claire. <laughs> yeah, it's like, oh, that's too much. So yeah, yeah, the no, amount of funny. color matters. It's yeah. the amount of color that matters. And so we have to pay attention. So if... If you're in a room and you're choosing to choose highly intense colors, then you have to remember that it is almost audible, that it is almost shouting at you. Yeah. And you have to understand that there are time then, um, time spans that might be more appropriate for that type of room. Mm -hmm. But the answer isn't all day. Oh my gosh, this room, so the peony pink is behind me. The lake is beside me. Yeah. And I actually have a cl mirrored closet doors in front of me with part Love of a it. white wall. And so it's occasionally in front of me too, depending on what the doors are doing. And then other wall is bulletin board and white. Yeah. So there's a lot of calm in my place and then pops of color in, in right. places. Otherwise, I think I would be, I would be exhausted. Yeah, it is. Like I said, it is audible it's visceral it, it it is something super stimulating um i think that those are things that we have to remember so it's it's really about understanding as we said temperament and then and dosage mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. when we're thinking about 
and and also it's always connected to impact what what are you asking it to do for you do you think color is part of why people really enjoyed working from home because it's a place that they could express and choose color and now they have to go back into the real world and end up in an office where it's they don't have the autonomy to to splash yeah. the colors on the wall yeah i think that when you think about home spaces they are created to give you personally mm -hmm. um, something that makes you feel a sense of belonging. I think when we go to work, sometimes people don't feel a sense of belonging. Mm. And I think that one of the ways to make people feel a sense of belonging is asking these questions and then creating spaces that actually serve them. Mm -hmm. That's what we're seeing in communities. You know, they they're happier because yeah. they were part of this. Yeah. Part of this. Yeah. My kids, when they were old enough to, to be involved in conversation, they chose the color for their room. And it was really, yeah. you know, really a, a process. Yeah. Um, have you ever seen an office that allows employees to choose the color of their dividers, for example, that maybe the designer's chosen a palette, but the individual actually goes, oh my gosh, I want to be, yes, I want these colors around me. Have you ever seen that? I don't think I I have seen that. Um, I, I I'm the person that wouldn't be asking for that. I want, I want this. <laughs> I think lighting is super important. So they are working on things where people can control their lighting, which also controls the way you perceive color. Yeah. They have found that patients um, who are in rooms that they can control their lighting heal quicker. I think that nice. there is a sense of autonomy and I think it's slightly different in a case where you're not feeling well because we are losing control over certain things. So to give someone back the dignity of controlling certain parts of their environment mm -hmm. or giving them a view of nature those are things that are quite healing. Yeah. And yeah. I, it's why I really love healthcare design so much. It's because people are, people's need, we have to support their needs because they're quite vulnerable, you know? Yeah. And you know, I agree with you. I talked about this a little bit in episode six, I think, with Andrea De Paiva, um, professor of neuroscience for architecture. So mm -hmm. exactly about this. And what's interesting to me is I live in Toronto, busy metropolis. I live on the lake, which is the the most effective way I could calm the city down. Yeah. But there's jet ski noise, firework noise, modified exhausts. And I think that, you know, the only noise abatement that we've seen is around quiet areas around hospitals, but everybody's yeah. healing every night. And we've lost, we've lost the plot in terms of understanding the assaults that we're under from noise and also from light. And yeah. I wonder, I, I wonder if you have any thoughts on that. I know it's a little bit stray from color, but as it does affect color. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm color is light. That. Yeah. I mean, it right now. Yeah. 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 Any so thoughts? I, yeah. I just, I'm not a lighting expert, but I do know that when I am working in environments where I'm choosing color, I am there testing in those environments Yeah, because they change the perception of that color. And I'm also working with various materials so that I make sure I understand the effects of those materials on one another. Yeah. So I think that all of that have, has to be taken into consideration, but mm -hmm. light is critical for color. So you could have the most luscious, delicious color in the wrong lighting, and it does not get perceived that way. Yeah. And that is really hard, right? So you really do want to be mindful of lighting. And that's why I thought the studies um, in healthcare were so wonderful, because, because we might not have the same needs all the time. Mm -hmm. um, as we're healing and in their room. So when you have control of it, I think that's important. And I, I also want to say that I've always believed that the office had to have a feeling of home because we do not change when we just drive somewhere. Mm. We don't put on this like, oh, now I'm a different person. We, have, we are whole beings that need to have our needs met in various settings. So 
the way that we are at home and then the way that we are at work, we need to be supporting different things at work. But all I'm saying is we are that same person. So the idea that we were going to go to work and be in cubicles that were white and gray and feel sated by them. Yeah. I don't even know how we thought that. Yeah. Right. I mean, because yeah. we're not, we're that we're, we're 360 degree, you know, whole human beings yeah. all the time. Yeah. And so I think that those are important things to remember as we're trying to get people to want to be part of a work environment, because now, now that we understand that we, we can still be productive without it, then you have to be sharing that there's a better way and, and motivating them um, because of want, not mandates. Oh my gosh. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah. How do you create that desire? You're not going to create it by creating a bland space. <laughs> no. <laughs> or, or a space that doesn't feel grounded and have organic elements and good light and all the, you know, the well-building standards that we know, but um, bringing, bringing color into the conversation is really interesting. And I'm, I'm curious if we can bring some autonomy within a palette that's been defined into that space to say, okay, this is going to be yours. You know, it, as we move towards hoteling and hot desking and people were, yeah. I wanted none of that. Um, but yet we have less need to be in the office that so we have to share. What can it look like? And I think you're, you're right that lighting has a part to play because that's easier to change than the walls, you know, to be able to. Well, it is easier. Lighting. And also we might not calibrate things the same way. So the idea we could be in control of our lighting yeah. um, is a great sense of autonomy. I think that because desks aren't like they used to be, you know, people aren't bringing all their things from home in their cubicles, which, you know, made that more proprietary and personal to them. So I do think there are, there are ways that we can make people feel a sense of belonging. But I think the greatest sense of belonging comes from knowing that people really cared about you and how you feel. Mm -hmm. I think you, I think that's palpable. And I think you understand when you're going in a space that was considered and you feel respected. And I think that is a really important thing as we're designing spaces for people. Yeah, so do I. Um, if you were to invite listeners now to think about color mm -hmm. and how it leads to this feeling of belonging, what would your advice be? And, and you can very well say, check out Love Good Color. <laughs> and well, like, I mean, yeah. you know, the essence of understanding color and how it fits, please, please leave some eloquent invitation here for people to understand more about what you do and how to achieve this sense of belonging through color. Well, I think what's important is that we, I think so much of good design is about the questions that we ask mm -hmm. ourselves. And so if you're in your home, if you're at work, I think one of the things you can ask yourself is to find this sense of understanding about what you really want to feel in those spaces and how it might differ from one space to another. Because the more we can articulate it, mm -hmm. the more we can design towards it. And I think that oftentimes, you know, the question is more important. It's not about brand color it's where is the brand color the most important and the clue is the answer isn't everywhere <laughs> <laughs> oh really <laughs> yeah actually i yeah i'm glad you brought this up because i did want to touch on some of the banks that uh, are in my country we have five major banks and they've each picked a color and they own that color really rather fiercely and what I've seen is the trend is coming more to anchor in that color and even have a logo wallpaper on the walls in that color. And then there be not much else going on. Countering that is white walls and maybe a TV screen. And that's yeah. and, and and the only humanity is the staff at the counter, which is sparse. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You know, mm -hmm. so yeah, I've sensed a, a loss of personality in in our retail environments, and we need these are the 
the places where I think there's the opportunity to feel connected to other people, especially as we have more and more self checkouts and the absence of human interaction. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, not just, I think about this often about this, this act of waiting. You're in the post office. Yeah. You're in the bank. How could we feel better doing that? And, you know, the answers are not in the post office or often in the bank because I don't think they're understanding like what people are doing or what they're trying to achieve when they're there. I think, I think some banks have gotten better, but I really believe that you need to understand where your logo color will be most powerful. And oftentimes it's not by using it a lot. It's by really understanding where it needs to be. I mean, a lobby, that's a good place. It's a sense of like where you are, right? Mm -hmm. But it is also surrounded by how you want people to feel waiting in your lobby mm -hmm. and sitting. And what do you want them to take away from who you are? Yeah, It's not the logo color. It's not just the logo color. Mm -hmm. And so I think that by asking questions of ourselves and being more connected to our wants and our desires, and we can then play to get there, right? We can then work. See, I believe like playing with color is one of the most important things you could do. Like I could spend hours just moving around chips of color, yeah. moving like fa a fabrics carpet. I mean, love that. I love it. But it's the play. And it's the play that you understand like, oh, this feels different. Oh, what happens if I do that? Oh my gosh, look at that. Mm -hmm. And I think that oftentimes we don't play enough mm -hmm. because we get so task oriented. And I think that that's, mm -hmm. it takes us away from, you know, that kind of fierce heads down thing takes us away from the opportunity of what could be. Mm -hmm. And color in combination, wow, you could come up with so many amazing things. Yeah. So I really want to encourage people to play and to probe and understand, you know, what it is that the more they can understand their feelings. And oftentimes their clients can tell them those questions. They can answer those questions, but they can't tell them is what color would make them feel that way because they're not designers. And that's what, yeah. what designers do, right? Yeah. But to get them to be committed to that part of it, you can then speak to, well, this will support that. Or here's another way to do it that might make you feel better, mm -hmm. you know? And I'm also not the type of person who only presents one option because I believe there are many different ways to do things, mm -hmm. but that we will, as we probe and understand, we'll come up with the right way. And we have to be open, you know, not so tied to yeah. This is, this is the thing, right? Yeah. What do you do in a shared space? It's not my end of, get me to the end of my questions. What do you do in a shared space when one person has a great love of saturated color mm -hmm. and the other person does not? And you've got to figure out how to design that space. To, so the two are, are comfortable. How do you deal with that? I think it's more about, um, understanding what is happening in this space mm -hmm. and maybe there's a way that one person needs to feel it's a very dominant emotion for them but not for the other person and maybe in that part of the space it could take a precedent mm -hmm. and maybe for the other person you're really listening to what it is and you could support them in that part of the space mm -hmm. so it could be that the sofa is something that they feel you know like it it really it's a big hug and that they want to feel that. But to you, it's not that important, but you want to feel grounded when you come in the room. So maybe it's the rug at the walls. Yeah. And so you start to understand like where those things are important. And then you can begin to, you start uh, to play about. Yeah. And start and to play with the palette. Start and the, to play with the palette. And, yeah. And yeah. also once you play together with those palettes, you're more invested in, it's not a mandate, you know, nobody wants a mandate. They want to know that, again, we're seen and heard. It's such a basic human need. So I think the more you get involved in that 
as a team, if you're sharing something, mm -hmm. the more that outcome could be actually really wonderful. And it could mean, as I said, that the other person might come to love the jewel tones because they're supporting them in another way or bringing out something they didn't know they had in themselves. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. It's fascinating as I think of leaders and their teams and the spaces and maybe an opportunity to get that input the way you did with the students in the schools, you yeah. know, yeah. how many organizations actually pull their people to be, how do you want to feel in this space? How, yeah. It seems, it seems like a lot of people might think that's too woo woo and doesn't have an impact, but you've clearly presented that it does. And I would absolutely um, agree with that. Um, it does. I want to, I want to do, a, I do want to say, I don't believe in design by committee because I believe that waters everything down, mm. but I do believe in people's input and understanding what their needs are. I think that, I think designers have a lot to contend with, but the idea that everybody can vote it, it designers have a very high skill and I'm so respectful of that, mm -hmm. but the programming the deep understanding in the programming is really, really important. And yeah. Um, yeah. So do you so mean we, by programming, do you mean, what do you mean by programming? Is it gathering input or is that different? Yeah, it's yeah. gathering information like, yeah, what are we doing? How are we moving through the space? Who's doing what and where? What are those teams doing? How do those teams feel? Like, what are those needs? Those are really important to programming and, um, I think it was two years ago, we, we worked for quite some time on Adobe's Founders Tower. I was able to work with Gensler and Adobe's team um, with Love Good Color. And we did the entire building. We programmed that entire space with our system of understanding what everybody needed to feel and do in that space. Yeah. And I think that the overall consensus is that people feel really happy in those spaces. And so it was a really nice validation and it doesn't mean that with time some of the rooms might not change or mm -hmm. might be softened or whatever mm -hmm. but the people felt like they wanted to work in that space mm -hmm. and that That's was yeah, that yeah. was a big deal yeah you when know? I was organizing with people um often people would be I've just bought I've gone out and bought all these bins and then and, and they would get you know things were in, in difficult orders and I would say wait, wait a minute <laughs> We first need a vision for how you want to spend time in the space. What do you want to do in that space? Yes. And, and then the second part was, and how do you want to feel in this space? These yes. are your two priorities. And I need to know that that's going to guide everything else. It's going to guide everything else. And I think that's the thing that I was talking about belonging. When you feel like somebody's already anticipated your needs, mm. when somebody is actually, it's like being at somebody's house and you really feel like they care about you, you know, like the way that they, um, their space, the way that they talk to you in the space. I mean, you feel this sense of being cared for. And I do think that there is something about color and that's what I'm talking about, the humanity of it, that can make you feel cared for and nourished. And I think that that is a very deep feeling and a deep connection and it is it's anything but surface even though it goes on the surface I always say it's anything but yeah it's the that unspoken warmth that you're looking for that reception yeah. I love you just made a connection for me which that I really hadn't um I have a um I call it the ask model and it helps you anchor into curiosity which would lead to these questions yes a stands for anticipate uh, uh, anticipate based on what you already know about someone anticipate what they might need to yeah. do their best right so they're going to feel comfortable to be able to do yeah. their best and i hadn't made that connection to that that somebody anticipating what you might need is a, an act of caring and yes. and absolutely that's 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 the point right to, and then yeah. supporting and then better knowing and then anticipating better and then it's this cycle of of moving through um, actually compassionate thinking about another person yeah and empathy like that yeah. we're all in this together and I think that when we went through COVID and we went through the lockdown we really understood 
how we were all in this together and mm -hmm. how important it was that we communicate openly and with strength and that we start thinking about each other as if we're one. I think that that is very important. I think it's what moves me so much about the kids in the schools yeah. is that I, I mean, they give me so much more than I feel that I ever give. And I feel like it's just so important to um, feel that sense of caring and connection for one another. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's so fun to <laughs> Well, congratulations. So <laughs> congratulations to you for weaving in a love of what you do, expertise at the professional level and working with clients like Adobe and partners like Gensler and, and then bringing this joy and possibility and hope um, and sense of belonging to those in underprivileged communities. Uh, tell us the name of the foundation. We'll put all the links in the show notes. Oh, yeah. So it's called um, Project Color Core. The idea was it was like the Peace Corps. We were spreading color love. Um, so it's Project Color Core. Yeah. Got yeah. Amazing. So we'll put the links there. We'll put the links Thank in you. for Love Good Color as well. Thank um, you. So if you've got a project and you're you're looking for design assistance and getting the colors right so you get the performance you're looking for um, and you're cultivating the culture that you want, this all goes hand in hand. Uh, Laura, thank you so much for joining me oh my today. Gosh, Claire, you're the best. Thank you. I really love knowing you and I love your energy. And thank you for having me. I feel a deep sense of gratitude. Oh, you're so welcome. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks so much for spending time here. Check out happyspacepod.com for links to all the episodes, including on YouTube, our online community, and helpful tools for work that fits. I'd love to hear from you leave a comment on social media, or even better, drop a review. And please share with someone else who you know also deserves a happy space.